Hello, my name is Shante Burris, and I'm a member of the Tika Sphinx Breed Committee, and I'm here to share with you all a Tika Sphinx Breed presentation. An introduction to the breed. While the appearance of hairlessness is the first remarkable impression of the Sphinx, among enthusiasts of the breed, they are most recognized for their overtly affectionate disposition. The breed is often described as being part monkey, part dog, and part baby. This illustrates a beautiful picture of what one can expect when sharing their life with a Sphinx. This is a very needy and dependent cat, which requires enormous amounts of interaction and affection. Ask any Sphinx breeder or owner about their devotion to the breed, and you will find a commitment, love, and enthusiasm towards them like no other. General description of the Sphinx. The Sphinx is not truly hairless. The skin should have the texture of chamois. It may be covered with very fine down, which is almost imperceptible to both the eye and the touch. On the ears, muzzle, tail, feet, and scrotum, short, soft, fine hair is allowed. Lack of coat makes the cat quite warm to the touch. Whiskers and eyebrows may be present, broken, or may be totally absent. But it is important to note that the Sphinx, because of the mutation responsible for the phenotype of the breed, we are not capable in Sphinx to have full length whiskers like other cats might have with normal coats. And there are several other breeds of cats uh, that share that peculiarity, which would be several of the Rex breeds like um, Devon Rex, some Cornish Rex, some Selkirk Rex might have broken whiskers as well. And this does not in any way impede the cat's normal function or limit them in their um, acrobatic capabilities. The cat should not be small or dainty. Males may be up to 25% larger, so long as proper proportions are maintained and that they are within balance. The Sphinx is sweet-tempered, lively, intelligent, and above all, amenable to handling. Here is a look back at Sphinx in history. Over here on the left, we have Carrere van Jetrofen, the Devon Rex, and Punky. Punky was born in 1980 and was bred to the Devon Rex career, which successfully produced a litter of F1 kittens. Almost all modern day Sphinx trace their history back to this breeding. Over here in the center is some of the offspring of that breeding, some F1 kittens. And here is one of their sons, Q Ramses. He's an F1 and he's pictured here at 12 years old. This boy was a very prominent male in most Sphinx pedigrees today. Down here at the bottom on the left is Jezebel and Epidermis of Z. Sardis. Jezebel was a domestic short hair found in 1975 in Minnesota, who was a natural Sphinx gene carrier. So she was a coated cat herself, but she carried the Sphinx hairless gene. She gave birth to Epidermis, who in turn was bred to a Devon Rex and produced Tika's first Sphinx outstanding dam, Z. Sardis, Winnie Wrinkle of Ring Curl. Here is Epidermis, the daughter of Jezebel. And here on the left is that outstanding dam pictured at 13 years old, looking beautiful. And as we go through all of the photos, here are some of the past breed winners that we have in Tika. Beautiful cats that represent the path that the Sphinx has taken to get to the look that we see today. And these cats are, you know, very important cats in our history. And so are the breeders that produce them. Now, the standard overview. Here on the left, we have the breakdown of the points. So the head as a whole is worth 40 points. The shape individually the shape is worth 10 points, the eyes are worth five points, the ears are worth 10 points, the muzzle and chin together is worth five points, the profile is worth five points, and the neck is worth five points. The body as a whole is worth 35 points with the torso being 25 points, legs and feet as a whole is worth five points, and the tail is worth five points. Coat color pattern, um, is worth 25 points, but that is just the coat since color and pattern is has no uh, points individually for the breed standard. 
As of May 2020, two proposals that I had written were implemented into the breed standard. The first change was to remove the five points we previously had in color and move them to the torso instead to better signify the importance and the, of the unique description in the breed, which reads, the abdomen is well-rounded, having the appearance of having eaten a large meal, but not fat. That is a very unique description. There is no other breed in the Tika um, world that has a description quite like that. And over here is the result for that poll. So 81.93% of the Sphinx voting population were in agreement with that proposal. And the second change was rewording the description of the profile to paint a clear visual of what is desirable and ideal for the breed. The description now reads, slight to moderate change of direction at bridge of nose, some degree of fuzz on bridge of nose. The fuzz or slight coating on the bridge of the nose is a unique expression of Sphinx hairlessness and is not seen in the other hairless breeds like the born bald Donskoy and the naked Peterbald who when they are hairless, the expression of their mutation actually creates a rubbery bridge of nose that is completely, completely hairless, which is unique to their expression of mutation uh, for hairlessness, which is different to the gene causing hairlessness in Sphinx. And for that um, proposal, it was passed with 88% voting uh, for it. The head shape for the Sphinx. So the shape is worth 10 points. The head as a whole is 40 points. The head is medium sized with a modified wedge with rounded contours. When we're looking at the head from the bird's eye view or from the front view, we want to see a modified wedge with rounded contours. So what that means is think of a pizza shape, but with a rounded edge to it. And when we're looking at the front, same thing. Think of a, a triangle with rounded edges. We don't want anything sharp on a sphinx. Everything is nice and rounded off. The head is slightly longer than wide. So when you're looking at the head from a bird's eye view, we want it to be slightly longer than it is wide. So by drawing with my little blue and pink lines here, I have shown at the bottom, these are the same length as these two lines here. They are identical in length. And I have placed them down here as well to show the difference in length, to give you an idea of what slightly longer than wide can be. But the wording is very ambiguous. So slightly to me might be different than slightly to you. So there is some room for interpretation in the breed standard, and that is purposeful because of the amount of outcrossing that is done in Sphinx. So every cattery can have a bit of a cattery look, but it has to be within reason, within the breed standard. We don't have a breed that should be with extremes in any way. So a very short head, a very long head, that, that's not what we're looking for, for the Sphinx breed. We want medium. Uh, the only thing that is outside of the realm of medium in the Sphinx breed is the eyes and the ears. And those are the two things that are described as large or very large. Other than that, everything is medium. So when we're thinking of slightly longer than wide, we do have to use some sense with that too and not have a head that is uh, very, very short or a head that is very, very long too, even though the verbiage that we use in the breed standard is ambiguous. We have a distinct whisker break in the breed too. What that means is where the muzzle meets the cheekbone, we want it to come in and have a distinct change from the muzzle to the cheekbone. Think of it like the muzzle is being placed onto the face separately. It doesn't go smoothly into that cheekbone and there is a difference between the two uh, body parts. Prominent cheekbones, those cheekbones are nice and rounded. They're a very distinct feature of the face and they frame the beautiful eyes of the cat very, very nicely. The skull is slightly rounded but with a rather flat forehead. And that floor, forehead being flat is actually quite important. It helps us have an even larger appearance to the ears than we otherwise would if we had a rounded or domed head on the top here, which would help make the ears look a little smaller. 
So the flat forehead is an important feature that gives a better impression of the very large ears we're going for in, in the Sphinx breed. Here are some examples of head shapes for females. So all of these cats are showing beautiful head types. Slight variations are allowed um, are, are to be expected given the ambiguous verbiage or the open verbiage that we have in our standard. But all of these cats do um, meet the breed standard beautifully. They all have modified wedge-shaped heads with rounded contours. They, they all have beautiful rounded cheekbones, beautiful distinct whisker breaks, nice foreheads. And this cat here, this photo shows specifically um, a, a head that is just slightly longer than wide, which is what we're looking for in the breed. Here we have examples of males. With the males, especially males that are intact, we're gonna be seeing some jowling, uh, which is a feature of the sex hormones. So that is um, the, the heavy or the thicker skin and um, tissue and muscling that happens around the sides of the face of the males. This can sometimes give the appearance, especially if, if it's, substantial jowling of a rounder head. And um, some breeds do give allowances for that. We still want in the Sphinx breed, we still want to have a modified wedge-shaped head, whether there's jowls or not. So it is important to keep that in mind with, with the boys as well. Down here, we have a neutered boy to show the difference between an altar compared to a stud, an intact boy, which will have a slightly rounded off appearance on the bottom compared to the more angled look of an altered boy. But even still, there should still be some beautiful arched curved cheekbones, a nice distinct whisker break, modified wedge shaped head, um, just a lot of lovely boys here that are, that are showing off their their correct head types for the breed. Here is a head shape illustrative comparison that I've drawn for you. Over here on the left, we have a correct head type, modified wedge with rounded contours, slightly longer than wide with distinct whisker break. Above here are excellent examples of the ideal Sphinx profiles. The left demonstrates a slight change of direction, whereas the right demonstrates a more moderate change of direction. Both are correct as per the breed standard. One is not um, preferred above the other. It is just completely up to each person's individual preference, but there is not one that is more preferred over the other as, as it stands in the breed standard. On the right, we have a head that is narrow and long. It's lacking in a distinct whisker break. The muzzle is long and snipey. A narrow head is a penalization in the breed standard. Down here be below, the profile on the left is too long. The bridge of the nose is straight into the forehead with no change of direction. A straight profile is a penalization in the breed standard. The chin is weak. It's lacking in substance. And the profile on the right is far too short. It's brachycephalic, which often goes hand in hand with malocclusions. Head, cheekbones. While there are no points in our breed standard for cheekbones alone, they are a very important aspect of the facial structure in the breed. The description of the head shape calls for the cheekbones to be prominent. So here on the left, we have two examples of males. And then here on the left, uh, on the right, sorry, we have examples of females. So here you can see, even with an intact male, the cheekbones are still very much prominent. They're nice and curved. They frame that eye very beautifully. And here's a different angle of the cheekbone to see. This female, uh, the lighting really helps to highlight those beautiful curved cheekbones. And again, a different angle to show uh, a, a different view of the cheekbones coming out and framing those eyes really beautifully and also showing that beautiful whisker pinch. Here is an illustrative comparison of the cheekbones. 
Here on the left, we have prominent rounded cheekbones that frame the eye beautifully and lend to the strong visual of a whisker break. The cheekbones being prominent are a critical component to the structure of the face, as without prominent cheekbones, we lose width in the face, as well as some of the whisker break and then balance is lost. On the right, the cheekbones are lacking and this gives the face a gaunt appearance and immediately gives the impression of more refined boning, which is incorrect for the breed. The head appears much more narrow and the whisker break is not as defined. Muzzle and chin. The muzzle and chin is worth five points. It should be strong rounded muzzle with distinct whisker break and firm chin. Here we see looking from the front view, the muzzle is nice and rounded. It, it looks like the cat is just about to kiss a window and that's what we're looking for when we're, we're thinking of a muzzle, a perfect muzzle and chin for the Sphinx. So these are examples of uh, the ideal Sphinx muzzle and chin from a front view. Nice and prominent, nice and full and well-developed with firm chins. The chin, even though uh, the muzzle and chin is only worth five points. Some people might not think that this is such an important aspect of the breed, but um, as you can see, I mean, it's a huge part of the cat's face and five points or not, everything is very important for the standard. And they all come together to, to create the photo, the, the picture that we're looking for of the perfect sphinx. Here is an illustrative comparison of a muzzle and chin. So here on the left, we have the correct example. It's a strong, rounded muzzle, distinct whisker break, firm chin. The muzzle is in balance with the head. This little cat here, the muzzle is wide, but it lacks roundness. It gives the appearance of a more rectangular muzzle, and the whisker pads are not full. Over here, the muzzle is narrow, and it's too small for the head. The chin and the muzzle are both lacking in fullness and this throws off the balance of the head. Over here on the right, while the muzzle is nice and round, the shape is pleasing, the overall size is too large and is out of balance with the rest of the head. Balance is key in every aspect of the standard and all standards and has to come together in a cohesive package. So more is not always better head ears. So the ears are worth 10 points. They should be very large, broad at base and open, set upright, neither low set nor on top of the head. The interior is totally hairless, slight amount of hair allowed on lower outside edges and on the back of the ear. So here are some beautiful examples of ears, wide at the base, very large, open, they're set upright, they're set neither low nor on top of the head. All of these cats have very beautiful ears, nice and big. This is what we're looking for. Here is an illustrative comparison of ears. Over here is a correct example, very large, broad at base and open, set upright, neither low set nor on top of the head. While these ears have a nice size and set, the ear tips are too pointed here. This is not specifically addressed in the standard, but the shape of the tips can drastically alter the overall look of the cat, as you can see from this cat to this cat. So a rounded ear tip is desirable. We're not looking for something to go uh, as far as, you know, a Mickey Mouse type of ear, but we certainly don't want there to be um, a pointed ear like this either. While these ears have a nice shape and set, they are overall too small for the size of the head and not in balance with the head. On the right, these ears are too narrow at the base, which gives them a rabbit-like appearance and makes them look conical. So that's something to keep in mind too. So the base of the ear is very important. And if the base of the ear is not wide enough, then you can have, even if the ear has a good height, it can really ruin the, the look and the overall shape of the ear. So base of the ear is extremely important. Down below on the left, this is another example of a beautiful ear set and shape and size. When viewed from the side, the outer corner of the ear should line up horizontally with the outer corner of the eye. So that would be the outer canthus right here, lining up horizontally with the outer corner of the ear. 
Over here, this ear set is flared and incorrect for the breed. This would be more in line with uh, some oriental type breeds. This is not at all what we're looking for in a sphinx. It, it's cute and it's adorable, but it is incorrect for the sphinx breed. And this ear set here is also incorrect. It's too high on top of the head and it's not what we're looking for. The profile, the profile is worth five points. It's a slight to moderate change of direction at the bridge of the nose, some degree of fuzz on bridge of nose. So up at the top, we have examples of uh, more moderate changes of direction, various lengths. This cat's head is a little bit shorter than this cat's. And then down at the bottom, we have more slight changes of direction. All of these are completely within the breed standard and none of them is more preferred over the other. Uh, as per the standard, it would just be a breeder or a judge's individual preference. Um, so we, we can choose what we prefer, what we like, but again, those preferences still have to be within the standard. And that doesn't give us license to create a brachycephalic sphinx, which is um, something that is unfortunately trending. Whenever we're breeding, our first priority has to be health and creating breed a, a sphinx or, or breeds that, that are brachycephalic or have difficulties with respiration, with breathing is not something that we should be doing. Our priority must always be health um, first and foremost. So moderation will always be um, our, our friend in breeding. So um, when, when we're thinking of, of profiles, slight to moderate change of direction, nothing extreme, nothing too short, nothing too severe, slight to moderate, we have a breed of moderation. Here is an illustrative comparison again of the profiles. So over here on the left, we have a slight change of direction at the bridge of nose. The chin is firm and well-developed, lining up with the edge of the muzzle and the nose. This is the correct example of a sphinx profile. Down below, this is another correct example of a sphinx profile demonstrating more moderate change of direction compared to the above example. Both are perfectly acceptable within the standard and personal preference may dictate an individual's choice between the two. Over here on the right, this profile is too long and straight. There's no change of direction. The chin is weak and is lacking in substance. A straight profile is a penalization in the breed standard. And over here on the bottom right, this profile is far too short and extreme. The nose break is prominent and gives the cat a more severe appearance. This head type typically goes hand in hand with incorrect bites like mesiocclusion. The eyes. The eyes are worth five points in the breed standard. They are large, rounded lemon shape, slanting to outer corner of ear, slightly more than an eye width between the eyes. Here again, I've made use of my little pink and blue lines. So here we're showing uh, slightly more than an eye width between the eyes. To accommodate this description, this requires a broad head. Uh, slanting to the outer corner of the ear, the eye. Now, when we're talking about lemons, not all lemons are the correct shape we're looking for when it comes to the proper sphinx eye. The standard specifies large rounded lemon shape. The biggest distinction between a rounded lemon shaped eye and a round eye are the points created by the medial and lateral canthus that are lacking in round eyes. So that would be these two points here, these are the medial and the lateral canthus in the eye. Round eyes don't have these, so a rounded lemon eye would have these, and that would be the difference. Pictured above here is an example of the lemon-shaped eyes as per the Tika eye shape chart in the Tika standard guidelines. So these eyes here do match these drawn eyes over here. So this is the correct lemon shape eye, but the breed standard does call for large rounded lemon shape. Here we have some examples of what that looks like on actual cats. All of these cats have beautiful eyes. We want the Sphinx to have a large rounded lemon shaped eye because large rounded lemon shaped eyes give these cats a sweeter, more open expression. 
a lot of times now we're seeing sphinx with smaller beady squinty little eyes that they can barely open them and this is completely incorrect for the breed large rounded lemon shape is such an important feature of the breed standard even if it's only worth five points some people might not feel that it's quite as important but it's the first thing that you notice when you're looking at the face of a cat or their 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 eyes so it's a really important feature of the breed and uh, a large eye makes the cat look sweeter, more kitten-like, more approachable. And it's, it's a very important aspect of a sweet appearance. So large rounded lemon-shaped eyes is a very big deal for the breed and it's a key aspect of their particular look. Here is an illustrative comparison of the eyes. So over on the left over here, we have a correct example of the proper Sphinx eye shape, size, and placement. The eyes are large, lemon-shaped, set on a slight bias slanted to our, towards the outer corner of the eye, uh, of the ear. The large open eye gives the cat a sweet and friendly expression. This eye here, while the size and placement of these eyes is nice, uh, they are too round and lack distinct corners at the medial uh, canthus and the lateral canthus that is required in a lemon-shaped eye. So those are these two points that I was talking about before. Without those, it is a round eye. It makes the cat look too shocked. Uh, it gives the impression of um, other round-eyed breeds, which is incorrect for the Sphinx. The Sphinx is not a round-eyed breed. We have rounded lemon-shaped eyes. It, there is a difference. Over here, these eyes are too small. The standard specifies large, and too often we see sphinx with squinted or beady eyes, and it detracts from the sweet, open expression of the breed. And here on the right, these eyes are almost almond-shaped with hooding on the upper eyelid. The wrinkles above the eyelid can sometimes alter the curvature of the upper lid, causing it to droop downwards. This can obstruct or limit the cat's vision and lend to chronic conjunctivitis. We must be cautious to avoid extremes and maintain balance between wrinkles and the cat's ability to live in comfort without any hindrance of normal function. The neck. So the neck is also worth five points. It is medium in length, rounded and well muscled. The neck arches from the shoulders to the base of the skull and is powerful, especially in males. So here is an example of a lovely female with a nice, well-rounded, muscled neck. And here is an example of a male as a comparison between the two to show you the difference between the musculature and the degree of power from a male to a female. The body, uh, torso specifically. So the torso is now worth 25 points of the total 35 points the body is worth. The torso is described as medium in size medium to medium long in length. The chest is broad, made 10 towards barrel chested. The abdomen is well-rounded, having the appearance of having eaten a large meal, but not fat. Um, they are not a fat breed. They should not be fat. I know it's said sometimes in joke, but uh, we do not have a fat breed. We have a strong breed that has a well-rounded abdomen. Sometimes we refer to it as pot-bellied, but it should not be fat. So all of these are females. They are nice and thick and strong. Having a primordial pouch does not mean the cat is fat like this beautiful girl up here. Uh, this is a breed winning female, a uh, lifetime achievement winning female, and she's exceptional. Having a primordial pouch does not mean that she is fat. Primordial pouches are a normal part of cats. Uh, almost every breed has them except for some of our more um, lith bodied cats. But uh, in Sphinx and in most other breeds, it's completely normal part of a cat and, uh, and it, sh it shouldn't detract from them when they're in the show hall. And here we have males. So um, oftentimes males might not have the primordial pouch. We see it usually in neutered boys, but it's completely fine in an intact male as well. The males can be 25% larger than the females, so long as proportions are maintained. We tend to get heavy, heavy musculature on intact male sphinx, including those jowls that we were talking about previously and when we were discussing the, uh, the head slides. But for, for boys, we see heavy musculature in, in our boys, nice broad chests, nice well-developed rears, round bellies, 
you can see here a, a really well formed rear. This is a, a young male too. So nice, strong cats, medium bodied, um, medium, medium long in length with broad chests and uh, medium boning. So you see even the front legs, how they come apart in a wide stance. That's to accommodate that wide chest that this male has. So we're gonna talk about the chest a little bit more here. The chest is broad and may tend towards barrel chested. Another way to evaluate the breadth of the chest is to assess the width of the shoulders from behind, uh, as shown here. A broad chest requires broad shoulders to accommodate the proper placement of the front legs, which should be wide set. So when you're looking at the cat from the rear, you can check the width of the shoulder blades and see the distance in between them. If you have shoulder blades that are nearly touching, you automatically know without even having to look at the chest that the chest is not going to be appropriately broad and is not going to be able to accommodate a wide uh, set of the legs in the front either. Over here, we're seeing the chest having a tendency towards being barrel chested, means that the circumference of the rib cage is more so rounded than oval as seen on the male pictured here. Here we have some examples of females with the correct chest that we're looking for. And here are some males with the correct chest. And you can see here with the legs being properly placed and here again with the female. Legs. So the legs are in length and proportion with the body with medium boning and firm musculature. The hind legs are slightly longer than the front. The front legs are widely set. Females may have slightly finer boning. So the legs and the feet together are worth five points. Here we can see in this female how the hind legs are slightly longer than the front. And we can see with this female, the difference in the boning between a female versus a male, but we still don't want these, the boning in a male to be cobby or like tree trunk legs, like we see in British short hairs or Persians. So we still have to maintain a medium boning. This is not a giant breed of cat. We don't have, um, you know, 18 pound cats here. This is still a medium breed, even though our males sometimes uh, by way of testosterone, can be heavily muscled and 25% uh, up to 25% larger. Feet worth five points along with the legs. They are medium in size, oval shaped with long slender toes. The paw pads are thicker than in other breeds giving the appearance of walking on air cushions. The toes are very long, slender and prominent. The legs and feet, here we're gonna be talking about correct rear structure versus cow hawking. So over here on the left, we have a great example of strong, excellent rear leg conformation. Proper structure provides the cat with superior lateral strength, speed and stability. So what we're talking about when we're speaking of correct rear structure or proper uh, leg conformation is straight rear legs coming from the hip, knee, ankle down. We want it to be nice and straight like illustrated right here. As you can see here, this cat is starting to toe out ever so slightly. So this would be considered a mild case of cow hawking. Over here would be more severe and this would be quite severe. So cow hawking is a misalignment of the rear legs. It has a range of severity from negligible cosmetic to severe. In moderate and severe cases, joint and spinal damage can occur. In Tika, excluding household pets, cats with cow hawks should be penalized or disqualified from competition, depending on severity, as per show rules 216.12, and 216.12.8. Those rules read as follows. Except as otherwise stated in this rule, judges shall penalize or disqualify, depending upon severity, championship cats, non-championship kittens, preliminary new breeds, and advanced new breeds, and shall penalize championship alters for the following. 216.12.8, abnormal positioning of the legs and feet while standing. Examples include, but are not limited to, bowed or cowhawk legs, splaying of the feet, or obvious towing in or out of the feet. So this is something that we need to be paying attention to in our breeding programs as well. And it can be something that is 
difficult or can be difficult to determine uh, on the judging table because some cats can uh, be nervous on the table. So when you're trying to hold them up to determine if they have proper rear leg conformation, they might splay their legs out or slide on the table. But if you let them walk around or pay attention, or as breeders, if we just pay close attention to our animals in our home and assess them correctly when we see them uh, mobilizing around our home, this is not something that we should be breeding if we see it. Cow hawking can be genetic, it can be passed on. And as you can see in severe cases, it can have a lot of uh, deleterious effects on the cat's health. So it, it's something we really have to be paying attention to in our breeding programs and, and in the show hall too. The tail, the tail is worth five points. It should be whippy, tapering from body to tip, rat tailed. The length is in proportion to the body. A lion tail, a puff of hair on the tip is acceptable. Short, soft, fine hair is allowed on the tail. While tail faults are not explicitly a disqualification in our breed standard, show rule 216.12.4 addresses this concern. It reads visible or invisible tail faults are a disqualification at the discretion of the judge or as required by a board approved standard. Tail faults are not always uh, limited to kinks at the end of the tail in Sphinx, Common tail faults in the breed include stiffness or corkscrew or cinnamon roll tails. So those are the tails that curl tightly like a little pigtail at the end. Sometimes they look like uh, cinnamon rolls. So they curl in a little roll really, really tightly and are often held typically on their side over here. Or it can just be a tail that is stiff in one direction. So a tail that wants to curl only in one direction and is stiff if you try to curl it in the opposing direction. Those are all common tail faults in the breed. So they're not only just a kink at the end of the tail or something like that. So those are things to be uh, cognizant of uh, for as it, as it pertains to tail faults. The musculature. So the mus musculature for the breed should be hard. So they are hard and muscu muscular, not delicate. And frail appearing or delicate are penalizations in our breed standard. Above are correct examples of proper musculature in a sphinx. Males may, may be up to 25% larger. The loose skin can lend towards the impression of a softer build when you're picking them up, but they should be strong and powerful nonetheless. Here is an example of a male, and these are examples of female musculature. So while they are smaller and they can appear more uh, feminine they, and their boning may be more refined than a male, they are still very strong in musculature. They have defined muscles along their shoulders, their bodies, their rears, um, and they're, they're a very powerful breed, even though they're medium, they're not delicate, and they're not frail appearing in any kind of way. Here is an illustrative comparison of the body. So on the left, we have a correct example of a sphinx body. The body is medium in size, medium to medium long in length. The abdomen is well-rounded, but it should not appear bloated, nor should the cat be fat. The length of the legs is in proportion with the body and the hind legs are slightly longer than the front with medium boning and firm musculature, which should carry throughout the body. Females may have slightly finer boning than males. The feet are medium sized oval in shape with long slender prominent toes. The paw pads appear noticeably thicker than in other breeds. The tail is whippy and rat like tapering from body to tip and should be in proportion with the body. A lion tuft at the end of the tail is acceptable. Over here on the right, this body is too refined and delicate. The boning is fine and the torso is tubular in shape, lacking the proper sphinx abdomen. The torso is a critical feature of the breed and as such is allotted 25 points in the breed standard. An overall small cat, a body that is too thin, frail appearing, delicate or fine boned or too foreign are penalizations in the breed standard. Conversely, a body that is too cobby should also be penalized. Balance is key and medium plays a big role in the breed standard. The coat, the coat is worth 25 points. So this is, um, along with the torso, the two things in the breed standard, the two individual items that have the biggest point value. So the torso and the coat are both worth 25 points. The coat appears hairless, may be covered with short, fine down, may have a puff of hair on the tip of the tail, whiskers are sparse and short. 
Chamois like, a feeling of resistance may be felt when stroking the skin of some cats. The skin is very wrinkled in kittens. Adults should retain as many wrinkles as possible, especially on the head, although wrinkling should not be so pronounced that it affects the cat's normal functions. So here are some examples. It's difficult to relay um, you know, the code of a Sphinx via photographs. It's, it would be much better if you could get your hands on them, but uh, they should feel soft and velvety and absolutely wonderful with nice thick skin and nice soft wrinkles. So let's talk more about the wrinkles. The skin is very wrinkled in kittens. Adults should retain as many wrinkles as possible, especially on the head. And this is a key point here. Although wrinkling should not be so pronounced that it affects the cat's normal functions. And that is very important. As we said previously, more is not always better. While the breed standard doesn't specify the desired thickness of the wrinkles, a thick and supple skin feels much nicer to the touch than thin, delicate wrinkles. And thin wrinkles can also be a sign of dehydration. While other coated breeds of cats can hide any number of scars or blemishes under their coat, the Sphinx shares no such benefit. It is preferable for the skin to be smooth and without blemishes, of course, but allowances should be made for minor scarring. So again, with the wrinkles, uh, I already said this, but although wrinkling should not be so pronounced that it affects um, the cat's normal function, that this is a very, very important part uh, to pay attention to. We spoke about earlier how in breeding, we, we need to be prioritizing health above everything else. And that goes for our breed standards too. The, the breed standards, it's like a blueprint for the perfect example of the breed. We pay very close attention to health in, in that as well. And making sure that when we write these breed standards, that health is uh, taken hugely into consideration and that what we're writing down is not going to be deleterious to the health of the, the cats that we're trying to uh, create or to continue on with. So wrinkling should not be overdone. It's critical that wrinkling is not so pronounced that it has a negative impact on the cat's normal function. So over, overly heavily wrinkling can impact the health of the eyes. It can lead to chronic conjunctivitis and entropic eyelids when the eyelids roll inwards into the eyes. And then the rim of eyelashes can actually rub against the eye continuously causing extreme discomfort and pain. This can be acquired or it could be um, genetic. So it, they could be born with it. If it's acquired, it can happen over time by way of wrinkles that are too heavy or just from a chronic inflammatory process. But uh, either way, we can make changes in, in future cats by just not breeding for this feature, not breeding for these heavy, deep folds around the eyes and the muzzle, because these folds can also keep yeast and bacteria. Uh, it could be a host for those those pathogens, and this can lead to chronic infections as well. So all of these cats, as you can see, are demonstrating um, just an, un an unhealthy degree of wrinkling. So the, there's some entropic eyelids going on. Uh, the, the eyes are, are heavily embedded within deep folds of wrinkles. And, and this is not healthy. It's not something that we should be advocating for or breeding for. And it is not something that we are, are looking to see in the show hall either. It's not something that is endorsed by TICA or by, by our breed standard. It's expressly in the writing in our breed standard. Color and pattern. So as of May, 2021, color no longer holds any points in the breed standard. All colors and divisions are allowed. Color can be difficult to determine on a sphinx. Pigment is not as saturated on the skin as it is on coat. A good trick to determining color um, would be to defer to the pigment on the leather of the nose, the paw pads, and the rims uh, of the ears as being more true to genotype. Breeders should also make use of genetic color testing to ensure pedigrees and registrations are accurate. Oftentimes, eye color alone is not a good indication of which level of color point is at play. Some sepia sphinx have aqua eyes instead of gold or green. Some mink sphinx have eyes which are more golden toned than aqua. And some pointed sphinx have pale blue eyes that lack the richness and pigment that other pointed breeds achieve. So I've created an illustrative standard review. 
So here we have um, all of the aspects of the breed standard and what they actually point to. So slightly longer than wide in the head, distinct whisker break, a broad head that accommodates more than one eye width between the eyes. The head is medium sized with modified wedge and rounded contours, a large rounded lemon shaped eye, very large, large ears, broad at the base, open set upright, neither low set nor on top of the head, slightly rounded skull, prominent cheekbones, strong rounded muzzle with firm chin, a rather flat forehead, slight to moderate change of direction at the bridge of the nose, firm chin, broad chest, oval shaped feet with long, slender, prominent toes, legs have medium boning, strong, firm musculature, thick paw pads like air cushions, whippy rat-like tail, rounded abdomen, not thin or frail, hind legs slightly longer than the front, medium sized, medium med to medium long in length, and the neck is medium in length, rounded and well muscled. The permissible outcrosses we have in Sphinx. We have several permissible outcrosses in the Sphinx breed, the Devon Rex and the American Shorthair. And as the Sphinx is a category three breed marked by an asterisk, we are also permitted to use domestic shorthairs for outcrossing purposes. Registration rule 307.4.2 reads, breeds marked by an asterisk have an unusually limited gene pool and thus may still benefit from augmentation of the available gene pool by inclusion of cats conforming to the standard, but which are of unknown or unregistered ancestry. Registration rule 37.4.1, purpose. The category is for breeds which typically differ from one of the older established breeds or from the general feline population on the basis of a single gene locus, like a mutation breed. Many of these breeds have originated on spontane as spontaneous mutations within the domestic cat population. Others have appeared within established breeds and may be the result of earlier mutations or outcrosses. Regardless of origin, these breeds are still in active development and may need to cross back to a parental breed to improve type or augment a limited gene pool. With few exceptions, these breeds generally have little to gain from use of cats of unknown backgrounds. While the Sphinx no longer has a very small gene pool, we still benefit greatly from the ability to outcross for genetic diversity and health. In December 2020, a DNA test became available for a novel mutation in ALMS1 that is contributory to roughly 60% of the HCM cases in the breed. As of mid-2021, approximately 70% of DNA-tested sphinx are either heterozygous or homozygous for this mutation. Penalizations in the breed standard would be an overall small cat, a body that is too thin, frail appearing or delicate or fine boned, too cobby or too foreign, lack of wrinkles on the head, a straight profile, a narrow head, non amitable disposition, significant amounts of hair above the ankle. Withhold all awards would be any indication of wavy hair or suggestion of the Devon Rex or Cornish Rex in molt. These are very important. Um, especially since we can use Devon Rex as outcrossing in Sphinx, it's very important that when we're going into the show hall that we are showing a Sphinx and not just a thinly coated Devon Rex. Uh, it's important that we make a distinction between the two breeds, especially since Sphinx are also a permissible outcross for Devon. So the two breeds are permissible outcrosses for each other. So we need to maintain integrity between the two breeds and a distinct look and type between the two breeds and, and that they are separate, even though we can uh, make use of, of both of them together for outcrossing purposes and for genetic diversity purposes. Disqualifications for the breed would be any evidence of depilitating, plucking, shaving, or clipping, or any other means of hair removal or the inability to handle. Let's talk about grooming. Overbathing is a common issue in Sphinx husbandry to the detriment of the cat. Overbathing alters the pH balance of the skin, which causes an overproduction of sebum and an unappealing tacky feel to the skin. Sebum is a natural and necessary component to healthy skin. It helps moisturize, it creates a protective barrier against UV radiation, and many of the fatty acids 
in sebum have antimicrobial actions. Though skin quality does vary greatly from one line to the next, diet and environment do play important roles in skin health as well. It's generally far more effective to keep the environment clean than to overbathe your cat. Most sphinx only require bathing once every couple of months. As skin quality is also genetic, this should be a point of priority for breeders to produce clean and healthy skin. After all, the skin barrier is one of the first lines of defense against invasive pathogens. Ears should be cleaned weekly with a good quality enzymatic otic solution. A study performed in 2019 by Dr. Older et al. determined that sphinx do have a higher diversity of bacteria in their ears and other breeds in the study. With the lack of hair, large openings of the ear, and high wax production, special attention should be made to ensure they are clean and free of excess wax and debris. Sphinx nails can become stained and should be wiped clean as needed. The deep wrinkles around the toes and over the nail beds can lead to an accumulation of dirt. Some common breed misconceptions. A lot of people think they're non-allergenic. Sphinx still produce the Fel D1, 2, and 4 proteins that triggers cat allergy sufferers. The levels of these proteins may vary from cat to cat, even within a litter, but generally paler colored cats and female cats will produce less of these proteins. But if you are allergic to cats, it's best to go and meet the cat in particular that you want to adopt and see how you um, handle that cat in particular, whether you're, uh, you react to them specifically before making any choices on adopting. Higher body temperature. Those sphinx feel warmer to the touch than their coated counterparts. They do not have a higher internal body temperature. They are a cat. Being hairless does not change their species. Easily chilled. Being mostly hairless, sphinx are more sensitive to temperatures than your average domestic short hair. But the general rule of thumb is if you are comfortable in the ambient temperature of the environment, then they will be comfortable as well. They do have some insulation provided by their thicker than usual skin. And it's important to note some show halls can be quite chilly and oftentimes Sphinx exhibitors will wait towards their second call before bringing up their cat to avoid unnecessary waiting in cold ring, ring cages. Gluttons. Finally, a rumor that holds truth. Sphinx are known for their gluttonous appetites, and this is a characteristic of the breed due to their lack of coat. They have higher metabolisms and thus have higher caloric needs than most other breeds. So that's the end of my presentation. I wanna say thank you. And a special thanks goes out to Lisa Bressler of Ring Curl Cattery for providing me with most of the photographs of the historical Sphinx breed winners. And I'd like to thank the following gracious catteries for allowing me to use photographs of your beautiful cats and the incredibly talented photographers for uh, the photos that I was able to use in my presentation and for all of you for listening to the presentation.